almighty and generous God, we offer these gifts to you because you first gave to us. Lord, we pray that your spirit might wash over these gifts and make them abound not only within this space, but all over your world. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today comes from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old. He departed from Haran. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? <coughs> Almighty God, we come before you today to hear what it is that you have to say. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill this space. Sit down beside us, stir among us, make us anew. So that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts shall be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week we began this sermon series called Reset. Lent is that time of the year in which we have the opportunity to hit the reset button in our faith. To strip everything away, to sit in the ash of life. And contemplate what does it mean to live a life of faith? What is it that the Lord requires of us? What would it take for us to be more of an Easter people? Last week we started this talking about sin. About Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden being tempted by the serpent. We talked about how the power of sin, how much the power of sin has on our life. We talked about how often we might commit the sins of doubt and disobedience and pride without even realizing that we are doing it. And now today we get the antithesis, we get the antidote, we get God's answer to the sin that Adam and Eve committed and the impact that it had on the world. We're going to look at the promises that God makes in this passage. What do these promises mean for Abraham? What do these promises mean for us? How are we supposed to respond to these promises that God has made? The simplicity of this passage is astounding. It's only four verses long, and yet there are six blessings that happen in those four verses. We're not given a backstory about Abram. We're not even given any dialogue from Abram. We're not told why he deserves these blessings or what he's going to do with them. And just a few chapters later, once God makes a covenant with Abram, his name will be changed to Abraham. His wife will be changed from Sarai to Sarah. And they will become the patriarch and matriarch of three faiths traditions. This passage that we heard Colin read this morning is found in the Bible, the Torah, and the Quran. This obedience that Abram shows to the promises of God is an example of how to live by faith for people of the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths. The Lord comes to Abram and says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. The Lord getting more personal and more intimate with each request. 
In the original Hebrew, this go really sounds more like turn your back on everything that you have ever known. Turn your back on the only land you have ever known. Turn your back on the only family and friends you have ever known. Turn your back on the only sense of security you have ever known. And follow me. I'm not going to tell you where it is that you are going, but I will show you if you follow me. When I was at UNC Wilmington, I was a student ambassador, which means I was one of the people who gave tours of campus to prospective students, which means I learned how to walk backwards with flip-flops really quickly. <laughs> and during our tours, we would be walking from building to building, and we would chat with the students and figure out, where are you from? What do you want to major in? What are the extracurriculars that you're involved with to help tailor the tour to who they were and where they were coming from? And I remember one day I had a girl on my tour who was from Hawaii. I looked at her and I said, why do you want to come to UNC Wilmington if you live in Hawaii? And she looked at me with a straight face and she said, because this is the farthest that I can get from home. <laughs> Talk about turning your back on everything that you have ever known to come to you. And I don't know if she ended up coming to UNC Wilmington, but I would hope that my tour was good enough to make her want to come here. God calls Abram to abandon everything and follow God into this new life. Think of the audacity of God to look at a 75-year-old childless man and say to him, I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation. I can only imagine the thoughts that are running through Abram's mind as he's like looking around behind him, thinking, you're talking to me? God, you want me to abandon the security of my homeland. You want me to leave the sanctuary and comfort that I have around me. You want me to leave the only support system that I have around me to go somewhere that you won't tell me? In traditional societies, the kin group, the family, around these people was the only source of identity, economic benefit, security, and protection that one would have. So being asked to leave such a fundamental social network took a gigantic risk. And in his attempt to woo Abram into this new way of life, God tries something different. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden that we talked about last week, humankind did not get much better after that. Brothers were killing each other, and people continued to live into the wickedness of the world rather than into God's goodness. And so God decided to try to wipe out all of the wickedness of the world in the flood. However, this cursing of the earth that God did through the flood did not really work the way that God wanted it to because wickedness still existed even after the waters receded. Humankind decided that it wanted to reach up to the heavens and build the Tower of Babel to be like God if we're all the way up there where God is. And so God came down and brought and punished them with many different languages to separate them around the world and not allow them to be able to finish the Tower of Babel. Following the fall of creation, God curses. In the Hebrew, this word for curse is a rare. Turn to your neighbor and say, a rare. God curses humanity six times in 12 verses. Six times in 12 chapters, excuse me. God curses them six times in 12 chapters. But in the passage we heard today, God gives six blessings in four verses. In short, curse and punishment have solved nothing for humanity. And so God decided to change from leading in fear to leading in love. The six curses, the six arrears, became six promises, six blessings, or in Hebrew, barak, 
Turn to your neighbor and say, Barak. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And I will bless the families of the earth through you. As crazy as it sounds, given the surrounding stories around this passage, it almost seems like these four verses that we hear today are God's last hope for trying to save humanity this way, at this point in the story. If blessing fails to work, the only other alternative that God has is something that God can't even imagine doing. In one sense, this view of blessing hangs on a single theological premise. God promises to remain in relationship with his creation. And specifically with humankind who he formed from taking dust in his breath and making humanity. <laughs> God promises to remain in relationship with us. God may grieve and even rant over the incessant evil that continues from generation to generation after Abram. But given the nature of God's promises, God will not give up on his creatures and his creation. Abram had everything that he could ever want. Besides being childless, he had every other thing that somebody could ever want. He had family. He had friends. He had security. He had a job. And yet, God called him to go, and he went. The simplicity of this passage is deceptive, because this is one of the most profound statements that could be made in all of the Bible. Abram is free of indecision, free of stubbornness, free of doubt. And his action is the opposite of the rebellion that we see in the Garden of Eden. Abram's obedience is the antidote to Eden's unbelief. This passage reminds us that we should not let our comfort and security of the present make us miss God's plans for our future. Abram reminds us that we should not let our comfort and security of the present moment make us miss God's promises and plans for our future. When God's promises have built a foundation of blessing for us to stand upon, how can we not take a step of faith into our future. Abram had no idea where he was going, but yet he went. Abram had no idea what he was going to do once he got there, but yet he went. <clears throat> Abram had no idea if he was equipped for what was going to come in the future, but yet he went. Because he knew that the one who calls us is the one who equips us. And the one who equips us will always lead us to a more perfect being of ourselves, a more complete version of ourselves. Abram might have had it all, <coughs> but he was not all that God had created him to be. He might have had it all, but he was not all that God had created him to be. God has promised not just to bless us beyond measure, but to also be faithful to us if we are faithful to him. Inevitably, such faithfulness on God's part means that God will suffer pain and discomfort because of this relationship that he has with humanity. Even with these promises and blessings, Abram still chose wickedness rather than God's goodness from time to time. The generations that came after Abram continued to choose wickedness besides goodness. 
even to the hill at Golgotha where the question of God's faithfulness to humanity came to a head. It wasn't when, or it wasn't where, but when God was going to have to give up life itself. Every new birth is a blessing. And every blessing holds the possibility of newness. During this Lenten season, we are called to hit the reset button and reflect on how these promises that God has given to us impact our life. How have we been sidestepping the person that God has created us to be? How have we turned away from the promises of God instead of leaning into them? How have we as a church been deaf to where the Lord might be calling us to go? Who the Lord is calling us to be? How have we as a church been resting in our complacency and security? God told Abram that I will make you a great nation, and through you I will bless the families of the earth. Theologian Walter Brueggemann says about this passage that it's not that Abram has a direct responsibility to do something for others, but that the life he was called to live under the promises of God will energize and model a way for the other nations also to receive a blessing from God. God's promises of blessing are a transitory concept. God's blessings and promises are not something that we're supposed to hoard for ourselves, but they're things that are supposed to multiply and be shared with everyone that we meet. We are called in this passage to lean on the promises of God, to stand on the promises of God and be a blessing. Abram is a blessing not because of his own skill, but because he purely reflected God's light in his life. Friends, the church is called to be a blessing to the world. Not because we are perfect, but because we reflect the one who is. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? Amen. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him. All who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess of our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now as forgiven and reconciled people, I invite you to stand and turn to one another and share signs of peace and reconciliation.
up, and you'll partake of both elements at the same time in that way. After you're done partaking of the elements, the altar will be open for you to come and kneel at if you so choose. I'll be standing over here to your left um, if you would like for me to pray with you today as well. I know with the way that uh, the coronavirus is out, um, especially in Chatham County today, um, I've, we decided to put some hand, san hand sanitizer out here for you. If that helps you feel more comfortable taking communion today, there's a, it's sitting right up here as you come forward, so you can use that before you come forward to the table. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able as we pray this prayer together as we prepare these elements. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, our Alpha and Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people, Israel, and spoke through your prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy.
table is ready. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. <coughs> join me in our prayer after the communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able at this time as we sing our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises, in number 374.
encourage you in this benediction to hear this promise that God loves you and there ain't nothing that you can do about it except to let that love live inside of you and to go out into this world, into this community and share that love with everyone that you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen. Thank you.